So I think we're about to start. How's everybody doing? Don't you feel like you're on an airplane a little bit? You know, <laughs> not very much leg room. There ain't going to be no peanuts, I'm just going to tell you. Um, we have a fascinating panel. I've been really looking forward to it, and I've had a chance to talk with some of these um, folks today and actually in the past. Um, so I'm looking forward to kind of getting into where they see travel, transportation, and leisure going. So I just want to throw one thing out for you, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So make them good ones, OK? Um, everybody okay? Everybody awake? Okay. So with this group here, I just want to say something to, as a startup. I envision one day taking the Virgin Hyperloop one from Washington to New York, 670 miles an hour. I'm there in what, a few minutes? Yeah. I'm there in a few minutes. Faster than teleportation. Not Am, yeah. <laughs> it's not Amtrak. Showing no ID to get on it, thanks to Clear. Buying a glass of wine while on the Hyperloop, again, just using facial recognition to pay for it thanks to Clear. Once in New York, I stay at the club quarters opposite Rock Center. I enjoy an amazing and unique experience just for me, touring the Metropolitan Museum of Art, all set up by Diamond Resorts. Then when it's time to go, I get a Blade helicopter to pop me over to JFK, $195. You know, if I got a Cadillac Escalade, it's gonna cost me 100 or more, so not such a bad idea, and I bring the family. I get onto my flight, booked on Priceline.com, I get a great deal. I again zip through security thanks to Clear. Once in Florida, a blade plane picks me up on the tarmac, takes me to the Bahamas. This is real, folks. And thanks to bookings.com, I've already booked my stay at Baja Sea Backpackers. I could go on and on and not even come close to what the, these folks are doing today to change transportation, leisure, and travel. And they are looking to do so much more. So welcome to the changing world of this industry. Democratization, I think, is a big theme of what's going on. We constantly talk about the Uberization of the world. Um, Glenn, let me start with you, because I feel like booking holdings and all of the sites that you have have really been about making travel much more transparent, bringing down prices for everybody. Yeah, no, we definitely want to do that and provide a great value. But what we really want to do is exactly what you just said. What you just described is our vision. Think of us as a system integrator. Look, we can't do all these things. We can't do the tunneling. We're not going to make clear. That's already being done and dying resorts, all these different things, okay? But we want it so you go to one site on that mobile phone, and it's all done seamlessly, frictionlessly. You don't have to put the credit card on 15 times. You don't have to keep going back and forth. And God forbid anything happened, you know, maybe something will go wrong. You never know in this situation. You want to have one point of contact who's going to solve it all for you. And with all the stuff happening with AI and all this machine learning, all the stuff that we're doing is what we really want is for all this technology to find that problem before it happens, fix it before you even know about it. And so everything is always seamless and you actually enjoy the trip you just described. Right. And there's absolutely no problem, no stress, no worry. That's the vision. We're not there yet, but that's what we're trying to do. Right. Imagine travel and getting around this world without stress. Karen, come on in on it because that's what Clear is about. You, you use the word frictionless to me. Yes. Um, so I'm a pretty stressed out person, so if you build businesses <laughs> due to mom, your own problems. She's a mom of three teenagers, right? Yes. <laughs> or it, almost. Travel is amazing, right, because companies like Booking have made it accessible. You used to have to call up and hold and get your ticket and then not know the, how long it was going to take to get to the airport, how long it would take to get through. And so this idea of both making things safer and frictionless, because in a post 9-11 environment, specifically for travel, it has made it significantly more difficult to have a frictionless experience. So biometrics, fingerprint, iris, face, I think voice is coming as well. Mm -hmm. Voice is here, but coming in a, in a more pervasive way, can make that experience safer and easier, where you are not taking out your wallet for every transaction to prove that you are you, but you are your boarding pass, you are your frequent flyer card, you are your hotel card, your building access card your driver's license, et cetera. So Rob, come on in on this, because I do think $195, maybe not everybody can afford that, but you do think about what it takes you know, for a car in New York, and yeah. it can get pretty pricey. Well, I mean, all of you guys have actually boarding passes for Blade. I, we couldn't help ourselves. We're $75 off, so it would actually be less for them. Um, <laughs> but it, it is interesting, because in New York, we have broken the Uber SUV barrier in terms of pricing, which during rush hour now is around 220 uh, Uber Black's about 163. So we're right in the zone where we need to be. And I think that, you know, 20 years ago, um, and I'll put, Karen would do the same thing. We'd, if you go to a restaurant for lunch and you went outside a restaurant and you saw a guy in a town car with a driver, you'd be like, whoa, 
this guy thinks he's pretty hot stuff, right? And it had a stigma. That went away. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we're doing is saying, like, no, you know, helicopters are not just for the C-suite. Uh, we're going to be moving to a new world of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which are VTOL. That's kind of five years out. Uh, and that when you have capacity utilization, these become affordable. And we're now dealing with congestion in cities where literally you have 170,000 ride-sharing cars in Manhattan. We have uh, two-hour drives to the airport, and this is a five-minute flight. So we're in a bunch of different cities. But there is a real issue. You, you have to get rid of that stigma. Right. And sometimes if you tell someone it's $195, they just don't believe it. It doesn't compute. But it's starting to, it's starting to happen, and people should feel uh, good about it. Now, Josh, come on in on this, because you, too, are trying to figure out ways to get from certainly big cities, right, with um, the Virgin Hyperloop and make it much more quickly. Tell us a little bit about where you guys are in that process. I think the part that's similar between each of the groups is that we're trying to change the notion of way you get from two, one place to another, specifically not from getting from someplace, but from the moment you think about going somewhere to the moment that you arrive. So I think everybody on the panel is trying to transform that in each of their own way. But for us, I think what we're really, really focused on is this idea of frictionless and this idea that if I come two or three minutes late, I actually can't be late for a Hyperloop because I have a pod leaving every two or three minutes. Right, so this notion of getting there at 6.04 when your plane left at 6.02 actually can't be a problem when you're leaving at 6.05. And so that idea of coming and having an experience where I get off the blade, walk straight through to my gate, or to my Hyperloop pod, is exactly what we'd want to do. And then taking that a step further where you could leverage the actual end-to-end -end system. So imagine having the Uber waiting for you at the far end, and it tracks you through the whole journey, knowing that you're going to be there, and you just walk out. Your foot barely touches the curb before you walk into the Uber. And That's what we're trying and to And it'll be accessible to everybody? Yeah, so we're trying and to I move, talk about democratization. Yeah, in, in most of the places, moving mass, mass numbers of people. So not 200, 300 people, people per hour, but more like 16, 20,000 people per hour. I'm in. Anybody who commutes in New York and gets on a subway. Mike, come on in on what you guys are doing at Diamond Resorts and how your you know, incredible luxury resorts and vacations, um, trying to make it more accessible to everybody. Yeah, we're, we're a little unique um, uh, in addition to the peers up here because our product is an owned product. And what we've really been focusing on and what we're seeing the evolution, we call it kind of the top of the funnel, is <clears throat> the baby boomers were the original consumer for the vacation ownership product. And what we're seeing now is our demographic is getting younger and they really don't want to own the product in perpetuity like the baby boomers did. So we've spent a lot of time and we've recently launched a 10 year product, which sounds like pretty basic stuff, but for the entire industry in our sector, we were the leading, uh, <clears throat> the le you know, we've been the number one person as far as being out in front of that. That We've now tested it in a f and it's been launched in every market except for Hawaii and, and California. So when we look at kind of the next 10 or 15 years, what we want is, is we want flexibility, optionality, and at the end of the day, if they want to walk away from it in seven, eight, ten years, they have the ability to walk away from the product. So it's not that, so maybe a three to five year commitment or something. Correct. And we still present as, as our main product, the perennial product, and it's still and probably will be 80% of what we sell. But the incremental sales that have come from this shorter term product has really allowed us to go more towards that younger demographic, which we need for the top of the funnel. And I'm curious who you guys think of as your customers. Is it, is it truly everybody out there? We just did a story in Business Week that talked about Gen Z and how they're about to become the planet's biggest consumer spending force. So we're talking about everybody born, I think, from 95 forward. Um, Karen, who do you think of as your customer? So I actually think about our market as two-sided because our partners are our customers. That could be airports or airlines or sports stadiums. You need people to want to bring this innovation and this technology to their customers. And then our customers are also our members. I will also say that we think of our customers as our employees. We talk about members being team members and customer members. So we have a lot of stakeholders. Um, but in terms of the uh, demographics of our paying members, 
I would say that today it is on average a 46 year old male. And so that's upsetting to me. Um, and we've been driving at greater into the female demographics, but, and I'm like, come on ladies, you value productivity. So what's going on right, here? Right. But I will also say that we've been uh, heading to a younger demographic. But again, you have to want to travel or attend sports stadiums. So the more from the power of the network effect, the more nodes that we're in, the more places people will join us and use it. Rob, is it the same for you? Is it the 46-year-old male? We're 30. All those 46-year-old males, <laughs> stand up. No, yeah. And if you're not a clear member, what's wrong with exactly. you? Exactly. <laughs> you have to be a clear member. Let me say that right now. Uh, 38, year, 38 years old is the average age, 45% female. But what's interesting is there's uh, nothing like an Instagram from the year. Okay. So there are a lot of people in terms of you know Gen Z, uh, older millennials who literally think, say, okay, well, maybe this is a little bit more to go to the airport or to go and, you know, whether it's a leisure route like Nantucket or something, but I'm going to get these ultimate photos. And we actually have six to ten photos uh, posted to social media for every flight we have that's over 30 minutes. So there's definitely that experiential idea of saying, look, I could go in a car, but I can also fly. I'll save time, but I'm seeing the freedom in New York City. I'm seeing the Freedom Tower. I'm seeing Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty. Right. And uh, so there's definitely a big part of that. And to your point earlier about um, sharing, um, in, from the corporate customers, we do see the older demographic. These are people who used to charter helicopters, or you know, sometimes companies would buy them. We have deals with corporations. So there's this whole idea that I don't need that ownership. Yeah. Right now, it's important. Well, you know, you hit on the experience piece, and it's and it's really something. I mean, if you look at us at Diamond Resorts, and, and in general, if you look at the vacation ownership industry, it's it's a one trick pony, and it has been that way for years. And about five years ago, we we realized that you know if that younger generation and that younger demographic that wants the Instagram story, that wants the Twitter, if they, they're into the experience, right? And yeah, they want a nice place to stay, but what they really want is they want to go back home and have had the opportunity to do something that either money couldn't buy or that was a benefit of their vacation or owning their vacation with Diamond Resorts. And we started this brand called Events of a Lifetime that was really organic. And it started with the PGA Tour where we would actually uh, host 15 of our members while they're on vacation with four-time PGA Tour winner Brian Gay on a Wednesday night for dinner before Bay Hill. And then the next day they would get to go out and watch Brian play Bay Hill and they would agree to sit in front of a membership coordinator the next day if they got to do this experience. And what we saw was we saw our close rates triple after we did this test and we put them in this experiential model. So what we've done is we've gone from the PGA Tour to the LPGA, we've gone through Major League Baseball, we've got Reggie Jackson and Gaylord Perry, and, and now we've actually moved into the arts and music, and we'll actually do over 125 concerts at our resorts. Tonight we've got Cole Swindell, who's a top country artist in Vegas at our resort playing, and we've got Leanne Womack in Orlando playing at our resorts. And so what it does is, is these folks, they leave there feeling like they got something beyond what they bought, which was just the vacation. And it puts them at a peak emotional state where when they sit in front of our sales talent, they really have a hard time saying no to an upgrade. So yeah. well, and go ahead. Rob made a very good point, though, about that picture. And there's no science that I've read about it, but I believe one of the drivers of travel is Instagram. Because people taking that photo and showing it to all their friends and their family, and everybody just feels, hey, I want to do that too. So without doubt, your demand is being driven by people taking photos. I am absolutely certain of that. No, it's true. We, uh, people, we see people do it all the time. You, you're probably more apt to ha be in a helicopter and hashtag Blade than hashtag Uber when you're on the way to the airport. So uh, <laughs> it's a general rule of thumb. There is a cool but factor. So it, right? it works. Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's interesting. Social media, I think, is an important metric. And I was going to ask you guys, what metrics are driving your strategy and decision making right now? What do you look at? Are there trendsetters or are there competitors that you look at? Is it social media? Well, we, we're, we embrace social media in, in a huge way, uh, not just with our team members, but with our 500,000 families that own with us. And it gives us a platform to communicate with them, to share with them kind of the new and exciting things that we're doing. And, and really, you know, Karen talked about customers. I mean, really, we start with our team members as well as our customer. And I encourage them to build their personal brand on social media and at the same time help us push content through Diamond. because. Whether you want to face it or not, the likelihood of them retiring at Diamond is, is probably pretty small. 
I think one of the powers of social media is both customers, but also um, from customer service, right? So not just the positive, but when you're hearing challenges, that transparency and that ability when we're obsessed with our customers' experience and NPS score to address an issue immediately and make sure that you're always getting better, I think it is a very powerful to tool for companies to continue improve to continue to improve and drive customer experience. Josh, come in, because you guys aren't up and running yet, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, how do you, I don't know, get people interested in, get the public interested? You've also got to deal with politics, right? And those involved in infrastructure. I talked to Elaine Chow today, and she's mm -hmm. certainly a fan of what you guys are doing and trying to move uh, ahead in terms of the regulatory environment. So, you know, what do you need to do to kind of help gain, you know, the recognition and presence of your company? I think the one thing that everybody can, I'll say, align to is that everybody's had a horrible travel experience <laughs> at some point. Um, but there are some really good travel experiences. One's like an elevator. If you've tried walking up the stairs, it's really annoying. <laughs> but the elevator is actually quite the travel experience, and it's on demand. But for us, the, the other thing is, what do you do? What do you realize that is happening all the time? So, for example, getting on an aircraft, how many times do you look at your seat number? It's an easy thing to remember. It's 3F, it's 2A, it's 27G, right. whatever it might be, but yet you stare at your ticket every single time and you become, again, a number. You don't become a person. So what if that experience was you never had to look at anything, you just knew, here's your seat. Whether it tells you when you walk in, Josh, here's your seat, or it lights up as you're walking down the aisle, whatever it might be. So we're looking to take things that are normal and commonplace that we just deal with on the day-to-day -day basis. And we talk to people, we talk to customers in India and the Middle East and the United States and say, what do you like about travel? What do you not like? People are more willing to tell you what they don't like. And specifically time, waiting. You know, we just had our first son and if he had to watch his favorite TV show at 8 a.m. on a Saturday, and that was the only time he could watch it, he would think that's absolutely crazy, right? right? That's not the world that he would grow up in, so why should that be the way that transport works? Well, how soon do we get? Virgin Hyperloop. <laughs> so right now we're working with the regulators around the around the world, but we're How's going to. How's that going? Be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I became an engineer. But that's part of the problem, right? Yeah. Because this is a drastic change in and how transportation would be going forward. Yes, and I think if you look, you know what what, what you guys are facing, especially with the VTOL and airspace conditions, are. How do you deal with an in industry that's used to dealing on cycles that are five, ten times longer than what the technology cycle is now? And everybody says the right things. They want to say they're open to new, ne new technology, but as soon as you get in, you realize it's actually quite a bit more difficult because the leadership is. But the people that can stop it, what's their incentive? What's their incentive to have something new when all could do is present risk to them? And I think that's really where if you flip it on its head a little bit and you give people incentive to introduce new technology, then I think you're going to give uh, quite a bit more, I'll say, speed to object you know, Ka Karen raised a very good point, which I think is some commonality here. Uh, you, make, you kind of were alluding to Twitter and the voice of the customer. I, don't, I can't remember a time where the level of expectations on all these companies were so high. Incredible level of expectations for product and service and customer experience because they have a voice. Like Karen's saying on Twitter, they, you know, if there's a problem, if there's a, you know, a delay, <laughs> a a weather issue, I mean, it, you know, and you're on it in five minutes and they hold you to an incredibly high standard, which makes us better company, at least makes right. us, and I think it's, and this is something you really, you know, people didn't have that kind of voice uh, just you know, 10 years ago. But it was a great opportunity. See, yeah. obviously, like we, we did almost $100 billion of travel in 2018. You've got a lot of people, and there are going to be problems, and people are going to complain, and it's not going to be our fault. But if you can deal with it better than your competitor, yeah. you're creating real value and a real competitive edge. So it's a terrible thing. I, I, I don't like it when something goes wrong, but I know when you fix it. But when you fix it, you get an even more loyal right. uh, customer. Now, I'm not saying we should wreck somebody's vacation just so we can then fix it and make yeah. them happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but when it does happen, you do get a more loyal customer. Yeah, they become evangelists. Yeah. They well, to, to that very point, I mean, um, it, you know, I'll just give you a, a real-life third-party story example. Um, we have 435 resorts around the world, and every one of them, my business card sits at the front desk with a promise to the customer that if they email me or call me within 24 hours, I will personally get back to them. Now, yes, I have a team of about three people that help me <laughs> monitor yeah. that, but they respond Mike, to them is that you? <laughs> under my cover. <laughs> but the point is, is he hit the nail on the head when he said what he said, and that is... They will, nine out of ten of these people, 
are absolutely biting nails mad when they send it in there. And nine out of 10 of them, when they get a response within usually an hour, just subside all the way down. So it does make a difference speed of recovery. And they don't expect to hear from the person at the top. And when they do, it matters. I think that's really the upside of social media. I think that's where it, it can really be put to use, where if you do have a problem and you put it out on Twitter. I mean, the last thing any of you all want, right, is a social media firestorm. I mean, just ask the cruise industry, right, when things go wrong. No, 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 seriously, though, right? Yeah. And they've got to respond, and everybody has to respond. And Absolutely. hopefully it makes better, better companies. I want to talk a little bit about data and privacy, because all of you, right, have a fair amount of data on all of us. Um, and truth be told, I think all of us would agree that we know that when we're signing up for services, our data is going to be out there. But I want to start with you, Karen, because facial recognition, irises, fingerprint, this is pretty serious stuff. It's very serious stuff. And security has been part of our DNA from day one, both because it's the people that we are, but also we bought a bankrupt company. So mm -hmm. in the world of having to rebuild integrity and trust, we started by a very public privacy policy saying we will not sell or share your data. We've been saying that for nine years, but as a little you know, newly out of, bankrupt out of bankruptcy company, nobody was really listening to us. And over the past two years, we've been screaming it from the rooftops. We work directly with the Department of Homeland Security and believe in collaborating with regular regulators. It's where the world's going, right? You see Uber and Airbnb and lots of companies having to work with regulators. So we've been working with them from day one. We've been very public on, we do not sell experience, we sell experiences, we don't sell your data, right? We secure your data and in return for that, we're selling you an experience. Very different when someone's uh, giving you services for free, you can assume they're monetizing it someplace else. And so um, we were recently uh, certified as FISMA High, which is a very high cybersecurity ranking. It is part of our DNA, it is what we do every day. And we're talking actively about it now because the world has changed and not everyone views it like we do. And I think that's incredibly important. We have a business on trust. We earn people's trust every single day. Well, and I do wonder, I want to get everybody else's view on, on data, but uh, recently Uber has become very proactive in terms of working with the government, either on terrorist situations and so on, and handing over or sharing user data to help them either find somebody fleeing a scene and so on and so forth. I don't know if everybody knows that, but it's such a 180 for Uber. And I do wonder, you know, if the government pressures you at some point, would you be forced to possibly hand over so, a user data? Again, in the policy, it says we will not sell or share your data unless subpoenaed to do so. Okay. So that is the policy. We're public on it, and that's what we stand by. Glenn, come on in. On You oh, guys have sorry, a lot of sorry, data. Sorry, Look, we're a public company. We obey the law. We do exactly what the law says. So if somebody sends us a subpoena, we send them the data. But you have to send us a subpoena to get the data. Now, there are certain emergency uh, things that you, you make changes. There are some exceptions, obviously, for safety issues. But the fact is, this issue of privacy is not new. It's, it's fascinating to me that everybody else thinks this all just came out of nowhere. It, you know, we're talking the Fourth Amendment that came in about privacy. <laughs> so this has been a big issue for a long time. Right. And I was talking with someone earlier. But it's starting to feel more real. It's more real, I think, because, again, the media and social media, and everybody puts it all around Don't here. Don't blame but us constantly. <laughs> but here's the interesting <laughs> thing about it is that Ron made that point about expectations. So we have our customers who expect incredible great things, mm -hmm. right? And to make that happen, you need the data, and sometimes you need to share data to make that happen. So, for example, we have a company, Kayak. We have a company called Open Table. We have somebody at Booking.com. These are three different companies. They're all owned by us, 100% owned. But sharing data among them, we and our lawyers have spent a lot of time. So what can we do? Because Booking.com is based in, in the Netherlands, and then we got GDPR issues there. So you have to make sure you do it all right. Everything is legally done right. And then you want to make sure you're getting informed consent. That's the most important thing. If somebody gives informed consent, then everything is fine and easy. We can use that data. What does informed all... consent, though, mean at your company? What You're talking mean? about a user? I'm talking about a user. And so is you... it very clear? It's clear. To me, it's clear. It's clear enough. It, it, <laughs> certainly, it certainly makes it You know what easy. I mean, though, right? Because I, I think when we sign up for something, there's lots of things that we have to read, and we're like, yeah, I just want the app or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say this. Um, I agree we need to make things in not legalese, but plain English for people who speak English. We operate okay. in 43 languages, so we need to translate them all into 43 languages. So people really understand what they're agreeing to. And most people say, you know, it's okay. I want you to actually share that data about when I'm landing on the plane 
and when the reservation is for the um, place of the restaurant. So if the plane is delayed, we can have that transfer right. so it gets changed automatically. You want that to happen. We want that to happen, but we want to make sure everybody knows what's happening beforehand and agrees to it. So let's ask the, the group. So how comfortable are you with sharing data if it makes your life frictionless and eases it, whether you're getting off a plane and your reservation for a restaurant's delayed? How comfortable are most of you with that and the sharing of data? How many are not? All right. But interesting is why. Why, why would you not want us to share that data among our two companies that we own 100%? Well, I'm personally horrified by all the data traffic. I live in California. Oh, wait, wait, we got a mic. Just pop it back. Sorry. Go ahead. 1984. I mean, really, I, I just think I'm, I'm amazed at how much it re is known about all of us individually, and it actually, it does frighten me. Any thoughts? I think that transparency is really important. I think that, you know, if- Because Karen, you're thinking also for CLEAR that it has healthcare applications. Yes, we are launching a, health, a healthcare application where you are your healthcare ID he heading into, uh, we're doing this in pilot and announcing it soon, heading into a doctor's office. And so as opposed to the clipboard, you are opting in, you are enrolling and opting in to say, you know, I am me, I have this eligibility and sitting down, having nothing to do with electronic health records, having to do with patient check-in. And so we wanna be really clear that what your experience is going to be Right? Who has that data, et cetera. We also think it's really important that people know where their data is. Specifically, there are more laws. You look at Illinois and something called BIPA, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to other places. You'll have to opt in every time you have an experience, period, full stop. That is the rule coming out of Illinois. And so we think it's really important that you have this communication, but also that people know where their data is, which is why we say powered. some experiences are powered by CLEAR. People need to know who has their data and what they've opted into. Because I'm curious, Josh, if you start to think about when you guys are up and running, right, you're going to have a lot of information, too, about where people are, where they're coming from, potentially, right, if we see a kind of totally connected world to make sure they get to the Hyperloop on time kind of thing. Yeah, I think the, the difference that we certainly have is that a lot of the areas that will be the first markets, whether they be in India or maybe the Middle East, they're actually not as connected as everybody thinks. So there needs to be a spot someone can go for a ticket and then spot someone needs to go to ask for help, someone to pay cash, something that actually becomes a transaction that looks quite a bit similar to what a normal bus transaction might be. So we're having to kind of re, I'll say, de-optimize the system for some of these first implementations because 50% of the customers actually don't have smartphones or 50% of the customers don't have the ability to pay with electronic payment. Um, so we're actually having to say, okay, how do we build, because that wasn't something that we really, I think, initially thought about at the mm -hmm. very beginning going into the Western world, but that's not where some of our first projects will be. Right. I think the thing that we spend a bit more time today is the actual cybersecurity of what will be an autonomous vehicle driving in a pod. So if we were to know that Rob was on a certain pod and that data was readily available and I could hack the comms to that, the same thing with VTOLs, right? You have pilots now, but when we go to autonomous VTOLs, what do you do from a communication standpoint, right? That needs to become hardened basically like a military drone. And now you're looking at a completely different way to have privacy of the people inside it. It's not just where they're going, but it's at any moment where they are along the tube or the actual network of the system. So we're more on the protection side right now because we're still doing the engineering, but this, the other fact that we re face is a lot of the operators of big public transportation systems are governments of the world. And so inherently, we have to turn the system over to the government to operate the system, like in Dubai. Right, or I was thinking of in China, yeah. who is already using, in many regards, facial recognition to get around some of the transportation systems. Yeah. So how do you as a company, if you don't necessarily agree with a foreign government that might make use of your data or have access to it, what do you do then? Well, you have to, obviously, if you want to Well, you to have to do it, right. Yeah, right. I know, but, but I'm just saying, okay, say, fair enough. Yeah. But I'm just saying, you've got your culture, right? And you've got your ethics and thoughts, and you have to think about your employee base. Yeah. Like, how do you reconcile those? This is a hard thing, because all throughout the world, there are different cultures, different laws, different ways to do things. When you're a multinational and you operate like we do around the world, we always have to be cognizant that there are different ways to do right. certain things and what you're going to do or not do. And do you want to work in that environment or not? We face it all the time, and you try and make what you think is the right judgment. Our overall mission, to our belief, and this helps stabilize it for me to know what we should do, 
is we believe that travel is something that is a force that's good for the world. More travel, better than less travel. So even though there may be some reason you say, gee, should we really do this or not? I believe that the overwhelming thing of making sure that people are getting together from different cultures, different societies, and learning about each other in the long run will make this a better place. And I think that's something that overpowers many of the inhibitions sometimes say, oh, we don't want to work there. I, mean, I think there's also a need to to draw a little bit of a line between collective data and individual data. We all have data, Good point. you know, kind of in the universe of our customers. You know, we have opt-in geo on the Blade app, so technically we know where an individual is. However, we don't use it that way. We look at, for signs and signals, you know, are people on the east side of Manhattan? You know, you could load more flights to the east side of Manhattan. Are people coming from the west side of Manhattan? We have data on getting, having some sensor people literally packing at home before they go to a heliport or they're coming from the office, not as an individual, but just as groups of people. And it's important from a, an IT perspective to be able to disaggregate that individual's information so you have that collective and you can analyze it to provide a better product or service. Mike, do you have any thoughts? I think they've covered it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am also curious about govern government regulations and increased regula regulations. Josh, I think about you guys in Hyperloop. It's a new mode of transportation. I did talk with um, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow today, and she's definitely, I think, South by Southwest. She's pushing forward to kind of try to get some regulations going forward on some of these new alternative modes of transportation, self-driving cars. Um, how do you see it? I think there the government's going on this. I think they're doing the right things. They're putting the right people. So for us, very specifically, in the U.S., something that is magnetic levitation falls under what's called the Federal Railway Administration, which is a really, it's basically the, the railroad governing body. And so if we were to fall under that, our pod actually looks like a plane without wings. So now you're dealing with not just one government agency, but two. And there's a couple of other areas. Aren't you lucky? Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's exactly what everybody has told us. It says, well, it sounds like you, you're going to have a hell of a time. And so for us, this group that Secretary Chow stood up was the ability to go kind of one-stop shopping. Just have a single group mm -hmm. in, the, in the DOT that we can go and pull kind of from the best of each of the areas. Now, the flip side is how do you actually make something like this happen? For example, if you build a railway in the U.S., you have to pay into the ra railway pension fund. So let me tell you how investors Again. how how investors <laughs> <You're lucky. laughs> view, view that. So I think trying to say how can you incentivize things to deal with like why should I have to pay for as a hyperloop yeah. a switch somewhere in Minnesota from a technology that's 200 years old like that's going to be a backbone that means that new technology will never come. And I think they're they're talking about the right things and hopefully they've been really with this group starting to focus on specific implementations of this which is really exciting. Rob, does any of this play into you? I mean, you're already... Well, it, well I, I, two things. I would say, number one, we've made a bet that there's going to be a long transition to EVTOL, to electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft. So we're doing urban air mobility today, but with aircraft that are louder and require more maintenance than what we'll have in the future. So we're not waiting for that day, because at the end of the day, it's the same experience where you can get those price points down. But to your point about old rules... We had actually built a technology to escrow all the cash that we get from customers before uh, what we call a mission happens. Because 70 years ago, there were tons of brokers that sold cruise tickets <laughs> all right, with plane tickets. And a lot of those brokers went under, and the people couldn't get on their flights. The DOT came in and said, all that money has to be escrowed. And that's the law that I'm now dealing with, despite the fact that we have substantial cash. We had to build, spend a fortune on technology to build all these escrows to fit in a regulation that literally is 57 years old. So I think Secretary Chow sees all this stuff. And I have to admit, uh, it's, she's really on the right track in the sense that she is trying to remove a lot of the cobwebs that innovative new companies like yours you know, have to deal with in order to come up with products and services in a timely fashion. Karen, you've got to come in, too, because I think about you're looking to do clear and health care. You talked with me earlier about that you won't need your driver's license in the future, you know. So you're looking to deal with a lot of, you know, potential government agencies and oversight that are not easy. So how, do you, yes. how are you going to get through that? So the good news is both my parents worked for the government, so this is an environment that <laughs> I grew in. up in. Um, so it comes full circle. We've worked hand-in-hand -hand with TSA and DHS 
since before we ever bought Clear out of bankruptcy. And, and we work in a public-private partnership called the Registered Traveler Program that was put forth by Congress as an answer to 9-11. And it's become a real skill set of how we work hand in hand at the local level and how we talk at the national and the headquarter level. And I think that we view ourselves and they view us as a force multiplier, right? They have a really hard job. And homeland security is an evolving area. The threat environment's evolving. So clear as a fo force multiplier for innovation and security, for customer experience at no cost to taxpayers, right? Unless they want to pay for clear at opt-in is really powerful. Um, it is a, we just stood up a Washington office. Um, it has been growing. I am surprised at, at how quickly it's growing. And, uh, and yet. Can the, I say, and let the lobbying begin? <laughs> um, but the dialogue. But everybody does. But the dialogue is really important. And it's just, it's, a, it's another stakeholder and another partnership. And I think that that transparency and that trust and our customers' passion for what we're doing and the jobs that we've created on the, you know, on the floor of airports is, is really important, but it is um, every day. Yeah, but the, the issue for us is that regulations by themselves are neither good nor bad. It's, yes, implementation, but for us, it's the conflicts between different regulations, and you talk a little bit, in the U.S., we have state, and we have federal and all that thing, and then you didn't right. mean it's across the world, and everything that interacts or not. And it's, it's amazing to me how it, it, hard it is to get different governments together to come up with one or two standards so that everybody can just play by the same set of regulations, make life a lot easier. I mean, we, we see the success of the internet, call it that. It's fascinating that the regulatory thing that set that up, we all go by the same technical standards. It actually works throughout Pretty the world. Amazing. It's fantastic. Right. I wish it would work that same thing for our commerce side. Mike, you're in a sweet spot, I think. Well, I will say this. I mean, it, when you talk about regulation from the resort business, I mean, we're one of the most heavily regulated industries out there. Um, and if you look at it, it's multi-pronged. I mean, it, it, at the state level, at the federal level, we're in 37 countries, so we have to take all those things into consideration. But, you know, if I was going to say something, you know, to the audience, and, and, you know, it's something that didn't come from me, but I heard it recently, uh, the gentleman that presided over uh, the finance committee who recently has, has moved on, I, I heard speak a few weeks ago, and, and he was kind of coaching different CEOs on what the different landscapes were in Washington now relative to the regulatory environment. And in our world, the CFPB was kind of this saber-rattling thing that was out there. And, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Board set up by Elizabeth Warren coming is, off of the financial crisis. Th that is correct. And, and the gentleman who was the former AG of, of Ohio, mm -hmm. you know, was, was running it. And he really was accountable to no one whatsoever. He didn't work for anybody. And everything was about a CID and a fishing expedition. But what was happening on the business front, you know, where the, the rubber meets the road, is that everybody was going out hiring these big law firms to do these case studies to come in. And what if the CFPB were to come in and audit you? And, and so the message that, uh, that came out of there is, is that, like it or not, politics aside, you know, this current administration has completely scaled down and stripped the CFPB down. And so if you're still operating your business in a world of the CFPB as your benchmark and you're in our space, you're basically in the dinosaur age. So the message is, is you've got to be on the cutting edge no matter what your politics are, and you've got to adapt to the environment and the speed of the game that's being played currently. I'm glad you kind of went there, and I, I'm just curious about, do you feel like this administration, to some extent, is listening to your needs um, when it comes to travel, leisure, transportation issues? It sounds like there's a fair amount of conversation, but help me out here. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we don't want to make this political, but... No, I'm not trying to but, make it political, but... but no, but, I, no but, I understand, but I mean, I, I don't think... I think you have to... Representation is... I think deregulation asking. is at the forefront, and I think pro-business is at the forefront, and I think mm -hmm. the economy is a clear indicator that it's working, no matter what your politics are. I mean, it's a, it's a good point. So the current administrator, TSA Administrator Pekoski, he has been very public about his belief of public-private partnerships, of innovation, mm -hmm. very supportive of what we're doing. And I think that support is really important, you know, because it's public and people hear it. So that's been helpful. Competition. I want to get into that. Um, I feel like uh, Google, Facebook, they have the largest pools of online consumers. Google's one of the biggest sites where Westerners start a travel search or look for comparison. Who's your competition? Who do you watch closely? 
Who wants well, to start? Well, we and you had some news today. Well, Marriott had some news. Marriott had some news today, but uh, you want to talk about Google, I think. <laughs> I do. So look, we've had a symbiotic relationship with Google for a very, very long time and helped build our business and they've helped build their business and we work together and it's great. But we recognize that they want to do more things in travel and they're not the only ones. Look, anybody who's got a lot of capital, a lot of technical capabilities, looks at the amount of money that's made in what probably is the largest industry in the world, travel, two trillion dollar uh, place to get some money. And it's where so, people are spending their money. And it's where they're spending, that and is. the tail tr the tail uh, winds are right there in terms of as the demographics of the earth continue to get people grow up and they get more money, they want to travel. So you can't, you can never forget about Google, Amazon, Facebook, and that thing, you can't stop there. You gotta go to Ali, you gotta go over right. to Tencent, and there are a bunch of people around here. The fact is it all comes down to though, just make sure that you create the greatest service, create the value for your customers, continue to execute and innovate faster than others, and you'll do well. Mike? Well, we're a little different. Uh, our, our competition, we really compete for talent because we're in the direct sales business, mm -hmm. and we compete a little bit for customers, but not nearly, uh, you know, as, as much as my peers do here, you know, in that open space because it's all about lead generation and target marketing in our world. It's different. Um, what we're seeing in the way of competition is actually coming from the bad guys. And, and what I mean by that, and some of you may hear this stuff on the radio and, or, and see it on TV, but there are these timeshare exit companies that are out there that are completely unregulated. Uh, they don't escrow any money. They, they really provide no service. And what they do is they take these unsuspecting owners of Marriott, Hilton, Disney, Diamond, you name it, and they basically convince them that there's another way to vacation where they don't have to pay an annual fee, which is, which is impossible because you got to pay real estate taxes, insurance, maintenance, et cetera. And what they wind up doing is they wind up taking ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars from these people and make them think that they're going to get them out of their contract with Marriott or with Hilton, et cetera. And ultimately what they do is they, they steal their money and they send it to a, a mill that is a law mill that basically sends form letters out. And because we're heavily regulated, when we get one of those letters, we have to cease all communication and all collection you know, with the members. And at the end of the day, they simply quietly go through the foreclosure process. And it's not until they go buy a home or a car or attempt to that they realize that these people not only took their money, but they also ruined their credit. So we're seeing competition from that side. So we're heavily focused both using litigation as a tool and legislation at, at trying to get these companies regulated. And we filed 11 lawsuits against these companies in the last 18 months. And we've had seven permanent injunctions and we've had two lawyers disbarred. So our competition's coming from the form of really a different animal. Right. Josh, I think about Elon Musk. He's building a Hyperloop too. So I spent- He's a little busy right now. Yeah, he's, he's pretty busy. <laughs> I spent the first uh, four years of my career after grad school at SpaceX. So the one mm -hmm. thing that really enabled SpaceX to occur was government, basically money. They got it through heavy, basically a contract, which was heavy, heavily front-loaded. A, a lot of development, something similar happened with Tesla. If you look at Japanese high-speed rail, you know Japan funded it. If you look at Chinese high-speed rail, you're seeing basically government entities. If you look at Maglev, you've seen uh, basically the arm of Siemens invest over a billion dollars into the development of that. So you're seeing kind of mega companies as well as government organizations that have made these large kind of moonshot type of projects successful. We don't have any kind of government funding, so we're trying to do that with an equity play, which is very, very difficult. I think the other side is you've got kind of a future where you've got autonomous vehicles, you've got vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, you have supersonic transport. I think we fill in the niche that's a high capacity system that's high speed. So even in that future where you could hop in your car from your door and drive up to San Francisco, you'll still care that that will take you three, four, five hours, right? Hyperloop would get you there in less than an hour. And I think that that type of thing is where we're at. And when we look at the Hyperloop competition landscape, it's all about, I think, being first. You know, Elon is looking at what I'd say is kind of the last mile solution, a low speed inter intra sorry, intracity network. We're looking at intercity between between the areas. And I think they could be very complementary, just like I think E V tolls and VTOLs could get more people into the city so you could live a bit further out but still have access to the big city just like you've had and then you could get all of the benefits that come with living in a city whether it's high-speed transport, healthcare, right. whatever it might be and so that's sort of where, where I see us 
fitting into the picture. Help the unaffordable, the expensive housing problem for so many workers. Karen, who do you see as your um, competition? So I think the secure identity industry has become an industry over the past few years. It wasn't one nine years ago. So I worry about that, which I see and that which I don't see, right? Because I think funding is uh, plentiful out there. So that's one point. Apple, I think Apple shows that they are very focused on identity and privacy. Today, Apple is all hardware based. Right? Whereas we believe the computers are around you and so you should be allowed a frictionless experience as opposed to still having to take out your, your phone. Um, we think that there's mobile opportunities to enroll, but that, again, a card, a phone, it's still having to take things out. It's not as frictionless. And then I think there's a lot of hardware companies. I think people see what we've created and the passion that consumers have and the applicability in so many industries. And I think that hardware companies are thinking, we could make 5% margins in hardware <laughs> or that. And you know, I think that that's important because you want to make sure that people are doing things in the right way, right? And if people don't uh, protect privacy and uh, facial recognition isn't the five nines that fingerprints are, that I think it, it could give the biometrics industry a bad name. So we're really focused on being out in front and communicating both the technology, the privacy, building the brand, because I think it is a new and emerging industry and people are really starting to flock to it. And Rob, I think you said to me, nobody's doing what we're doing. Well, today. Okay. All right. I think the bet you know that we made is that a lot of this technology is going to take longer than people expect. So Uber made a, a bet. They started a, in a division called Elevate to focus on eVTOL. Uh, and they made the decision we were going to skip helicopters. We're going to go straight to eVTOL. We're, we view that there's going to be more of a cohabitation phase. Well, you'll have helicopters uh, kind of living side by side with eVTOL. The eVTOL will probably take four people maybe less than 30 miles, maybe 900 pounds capacity, whereas a helicopter could go 90 miles, maybe 1,600 pounds capacity. So, th I, and they had very aggressive timelines of 2021, 2023. I think those are probably extremely um, ambitious. Um, so we, we made that bet that we're gonna be here for this stage because we're gonna do urban, we're gonna fly people today. I think at some point, you know, Uber could circle back on that and pivot mm -hmm. and come back to helicopters and if so you know this is what we do we don't do scooters in the morning and cars in the afternoon we fly people and it's about safety and i think safety is really important to everybody on this panel when you think about certification of new technologies right. it took 10 years to certify the honda jet we obviously saw it happen recently uh with the 737 max a 35 year old aircraft that was recertified in a different version so when you think about eVTOL, where you're dealing with a brand new type of propulsion system, brand new type of aerodynamics, no ability to glide, so now you're going to have to deal with parachutes, that's going to be a long process. And also air traffic control, for when I mean, we start thinking about self-driving, self-flying, right. hacking you know, an eVTOL. So it's just going to take time. And I think Secretary Chow says it's going to be probably, uh, it's, going to be, it's, it's going to be longer than some people think, and it's going to be shorter than a lot of other people think in time. There'll be all the but, drones in the air bringing Yeah, so what we want to do is like, let's yeah. get this yeah. right now using existing infrastructure, ex the existing regulatory environment, fly people at a fair price, and when the technology is ready and it's safe, we'll be there. So I'd love to open it up to questions. Anybody have some questions for our panel? Um, go ahead. Uh, we're going to bring a mic up. But... Go ahead. Right you're right over here in the front. Uh, thank you. Just uh, with regard to competition, uh, no one mentioned the public sector. And I'm just curious as to whether uh, two things. One, you worry about absolving the government from providing basic transportation services uh, when you talk about democratization, uh, but also whether, and you've probably had the misfortune of taking things like the air train um, or you know, you look at TSA Pre, are, are current government services uh, competition for you or is, it, or is it only private sector providers? Is that to anybody specifically, or? Kind of to this sector, I think. Okay. I mean, yeah. We look at it as collaboration and cooperation. So again, we think of everything as a force multiplier. About 70% of our customers today are pre-check eligible on any given day. And so again, I think it's about working together. It's about bringing technology to the checkpoint. It's about bringing humans to the checkpoint, right? So we'll be five to 10% of the workforce in any airport that we are, and we're doing anything from directing people you know, to different locations that they may have questions on to helping TSA. So I don't think of it as, as um, competition. I think it very much as cooperation and partnership. Another question right here? Oh, we'll go both sides. This question is for Rob. Um, how do you envision not just Blade expanding as 
but the other companies who are going to be providing similar services in terms of real estate, where are all of these helicopters, pause, whatever you want to call them, where are they going to be landing? Well, we have a, one of our largest uh, investors is Colony Capital, a real estate company. We have a, a, joint, a working group with uh, Vornado. We also work with Related, who started the largest private development, Hudson Yards, in New York City. And right now, if you're thinking about building a building, uh, in a, whether it be L.A. or New York City or any major metropolitan area, you're starting thinking about it now. It's probably 10 years before people are going to start moving in probably, right? So you have to think about what your strategy is with urban air mobility today. And uh, so we work very closely with people on the infrastructure side to make sure, like, do you have the right amount of power on your roof? Do you have secure elevators that you can bring people to the top? You, there will be, people will be landing on buildings again. Uh, but the key is when the technology on the VTOL side is good enough that it's actually quiet. The thing that stops us from having more landing zones right now is noise. Once, these equi once the equipment gets quiet, we'll have more opportunity, and that's when your addressable market opens up. So the infrastructure providers, the real estate companies, have to think about that today, uh, and they are. Uh, but the equipment will have to be there to be able to service it. I think there was another question right on the other side. So my question is, uh, obviously, for managing a global company such as yours in booking holding, I mean, there are some CEOs out there that are asking for more government regulations. And I know it's very conflicting that uh, at one point you want to provide safety for people and security. And on the other, security is up for uh, interpretation for different governments. Some just want self-preservation, uh, and they consider uh, other things as, you know, threatening their security versus their just freedom of speech. So how do you deal with sharing information with governments that are asking for regulations that are not necessarily going with your code of ethics? Right. Well, it really depends on who is the customer, where was the information given, and what are the rules and laws of that country. And we follow the laws, and we follow what they say. So if we're in a particular uh, jurisdiction that has certain types of laws that says we have to hand over the information if a certain official comes and asks for it. If that person is related to that, then we'll do that. In fact, it's interesting, what we're trying, in some countries, what we're trying to do, we're not trying, we are doing this, is segregating data. So that if somebody does some sort of, in one country, we don't want uh, another country to be able to access that information so that we can maintain a, a level of privacy that's entitled to that customer where they're making their transaction from. That's something that's very important. But the fact is, if you want to go to certain countries around this world, you are implicitly agreeing to give them certain types of information. Now, you don't have to give them that information if you don't want to. But that means you can't go there. In many, many, many countries around the world, not the US, you have to give your passport at the desk. And that passport is accessible. That information is accessible to you by the police in that, in that area. Now, you don't have to do that. And the way you don't have to do it is by not going there. That's the choice to make. Um, our philosophy is really, look, we don't make these laws, we don't make these rules, and if I was emperor, I would have a certain set of rules, but I'm not <laughs> emperor, I'm CEO. So what we have to do is follow those rules because we want to do it in a way that, as I said earlier, helps promote more travel, and hopefully over a long period of time, it's going to take a long time, but hopefully maybe the whole world will get more to a standard that I feel uh, more comfortable with. Emperor Glenn works for me. I'll go for it. Okay. <laughs> One last question, maybe? Please. We'll try and squeeze in these last two. I'm really curious about the small decisions that, you know, whoever goes first can answer, but um, the small decisions that you have made that have end up making a really big impact because I'm a member of CLEAR and every time I go, they say, welcome back. And I know that is a conscious, very deliberate act, right? I have, I've used Blade and every time I go, I am walking side by side, either somebody who's taking me there or the pilot. Right now, hearing you, Michael, talk about this, you know, the, the business card that you put out. These are potentially small decisions that seem to, to, to have some pretty big impact. So I would just be curious to hear what other small things that we as customers may, may experience that, that have made really big differences. 
Great question. So I'll take that first, and thanks for saying that, which is I think it depends on your North Star. And our North Star is we're obsessed with our customers' experience and security. It's not an or. So then you start to filter from that. And if you're obsessed with your customers' experience, where else do you have great experiences? I have great experiences at restaurants in New York City run by Danny Myers. So the first thing we did was hire Danny Myers' organization for training. And then we hired people at a Danny Myers' organization. So I think it starts to, <laughs> to come yep. to clear and do our training. And so I think it really... Um, you know, diversity of team, diversity of experiences, and you pull from the best. And I come from asset management, and so I've had a front row at some of the best management teams, Priceline being one of them, now booking, um, and some of the worst. And you pull from the best and don't repeat the worst and align yourselves with great people based on your North Star. And it's a bunch of little decisions that come off of that. Anyone else? Oh, oh, oh thanks. Well, glad you tried blade and light too. Uh, but my example. This was great. I mean, this is, uh, are you a plant? Um, so. Uh, you did really well. It re yeah. I, I think that uh, customer obsession is probably a commonality here. And I think that, you know, we have something called the run of show, which is what happens from the moment you book to when you show up at a blade terminal to when you get checked in, give your ID, how you walk safely onto an aircraft, how you're actually seated, we call it stacking. Where, you know, where would you sit versus someone else? Why do you have that colored wristband? You're, you know, why your bags tagged a certain color? You actually have to go through that whole customer journey. We make our employees do work on the phones. They have to serve uh, behind bars at lounges. They have to check people in. You have to see the whole cycle of every single part of the organization. And then you're going to see where these little things are. And that creates a mosaic of a great experience. But if you keep your organization away from certain other parts, they're not going to appreciate it. And you're going to miss things. We listen to phone calls incessantly six hours a week. Because that's where you hear the friction in which we're trying to remove. Like someone had a bad experience. How long did they wait? What went wrong? How do we fix that? It's called triage. And it, you, someone said the word recovery. We, at the end of the day, when someone has a, a bad experience, it's about that recovery. And it's very, you know, a, a customer who is uh, unhappy is much more valuable once you've turned him than a customer who's happy from day one. Absolutely. We need to wrap up, but I wanted to get some final thoughts from our panel. And Mike, maybe you can start, but I'm, I'm curious, fast forward 10 to 20 years, where do you expect your company to be, or, or what service might you be offering or involved in that the audience might find surprising? Right. Where's it all going? Yeah, well, I tell you, you know, I mean, we, uh, we have to, we're currently owned by private equity, and uh, their investment thesis said 36 to 48 months. So, you hello, know, public market. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, uh, we have that coming down the, you know, the track here pretty quick. Uh, but I would say that we have done a great job at innovating. We have been a first mover in our space. Our benchmark, honestly, is pretty low because people tend to do things. It's a niche market, and they just kind of keep doing things the way they do things. And we've taken a very entrepreneurial view. Uh, some of the things I talked about earlier, you know, with the experiential model is going to, without question, supersede the real estate over time. And today, while 15% of our purchasers may buy the product that's a 10-year product, that's going to turn itself undoubtedly on its head going forward. So we think that uh, continuing to stay relevant uh, to the next demographic. Now, the one thing I did fail to say is that our average transaction size is about $28,000, and today the millennials don't have a lot of money, so we need them to make some money. We need to make some money. And a lot of people do deals cash, correct? Correct. Well, we, do, we finance, too, but yes, they do both. 10 to 20 years. What's booking holdings? Well, what might surprise us? Well, I don't know if it'll surprise me. Maybe it'll surprise you. <laughs> I want to create a system that really gets rid of so many of the troubles we have been talking about here about travel. It's still frustrating. It's still annoying. And the fact is, not all of us are as fortunate in this conference here who get to travel a lot. A lot of people don't get to do that. But if you think about one of the most important things in your lives that you remember, it's maybe your kids being born, maybe it's your wedding, and then it's your holidays. You think about what you think about that made you happy with your family, you want to be able to do that for everybody around the world. You want to make it affordable, mm -hmm. you want to make it easy, and you want to, God forbid something goes wrong because they don't get to do it a lot, you want to make it right for them. And that's what I want to do, because I know it makes the world better. And I want it to be nice when I come home so that my vacation isn't all of a sudden erased. <laughs> <laughs> when I hit. The first hour? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> vacation from your vacation. Yeah. Exactly. I'm familiar with that phenomenon. So, are we going to have hyperloops all around the globe in 10 years? Yes, I don't think they'll be all around the globe. 
I think it's a little bit unrealistic. But what I market think, will we see most? I think you'll probably see India quite a bit because they are a huge amount of population. There's going to be 300 million people that move into cities in India in the next 30 years. And so you're going to see a whole bunch of need, demand for high-speed transit there. Why invest in trains when you can do Hyperloop? I think the other thing is you'll see probably about a dozen or so projects around the world. And then I think at a high level, we're building, you heard Rob mention earlier, what eVTOLs are going to be. They're maybe 900 pounds of people. We're building a vehicle that's <coughs> five times bigger, that's a battery-driven vehicle that's autonomous in a network. So now you can start to think what other things will have that in the future. Bigger aircraft, bigger electric aircraft, uh, existing transportation networks optimized for the fleet as opposed to the individual car. And just quickly, because I know that our session's over, Karen. You could leave home without your wallet and function in most things that you would do every day. That's a Today huge, you panic. Huge trend. Rob? Quiet and carbon neutral. Um, and that's what you're going to see in more places to land. And that's probably 10 years. I can't see past 10 years. How cool were these guys? <laughs> Thank you, everybody.